What I experienced in Mexico was community in, in almost every town or village that we went to. And what I found here, in most cases in, in the States, was that folks were really hiding or separating ar around, uh, uh, not actively involved in community. And so that was something that I really wanted. And then uh, we actually started building community here in the Applegate ar around a lot of these issues. And the more that that happened, then the less I was attracted to going to someplace else. So how did you do that? How did you build community? Well, I don't know if that I knew how to do it. Uh, the, I think we backed into it more than anything else. Uh, I, th I think that, that a, a lot of the... I, I was on the board of Headwaters at the time in Grants Pass. And part of what, what bothered me or with being with Headwaters is that we were, we were very effective in stopping uh, egregious timber sales and things like that, mostly through litigation. But it was, it was, it was like, you know, uh, we were winning the battle and losing the war because it was constantly, it was just continuous. So it was, if, it, if it was one timber sale, it was another and another and another. And, and at some point in time, the light came on and said, we've got to figure out a different way to do business. We've got to do it some other way. And I, th I ended up writing a, a, an op-ed piece that uh, I think it was in the Medford Mail Tribune or the Grants Pass Courier, I don't remember which. And it went out on the AP and it ended up in the Bend Bulletin. And a guy by the name of Jim Neal, who was a logger, uh, for Croman Corporation, uh, read the article and called me up and said it's the first time he'd ever read an article by an environmentalist that, that he agreed with. And he, he, he called me and, and said, uh, let's get together. He says, I come to, uh, he works for Croman, which is located here in White City. So he comes down quite often and he says, next time I come, we'll, we'll have breakfast together and talk. And we did, and we started, we started a conversation and found that we had a lot, a lot of issues in common. And so uh, we continued talking about this and, and we said, you know, we need, to, we need to pick a place where we can demonstrate how to do this stuff. And, and, and we looked at, at, at a map of the Rogue Basin and we said that's way too, too big and way too politically fragmented, you know, with multiple counties and multiple cities and and the more we looked around, we ended up seeing that here's the Applegate that, that have no, it's all un, unincorporated rural community. So there, there's no cities out here. The only, the only governmental overlay that's here are, are the, is the county government, which is little or, little or nothing is done out here by the county other than road, road maintenance and, you know, uh, sheriff's department issues. And uh, the, the, a couple of irrigation districts and a couple of fire districts. And so, so politically, it was much less uh, fragmented than a lot of the other communities. And so that's where we decided to, the, to see if we could develop this. And we didn't know what it was, but we just wanted to develop a different way of doing business. And, uh, you know, this, this whole business of appeal and litig litigation was not very fulfilling, nor did it really stop the problem. It just it was a temporary thumb in the dike uh, sort of situation. And uh, I think in 19, I don't remember what year we, 97, 92, 92 that's right, 1992. Uh, Jim and I started, that was when I, Jim and I had started talking and in, in the latter part of 92, we, I had taken him, I was taking him to, envir to the environmental group meetings and he was taking me to the timber industry folks. And we were, and, and there was a total lack of trust from either group toward the other. And at some point in time we said, let's, we, we kind of 
brought up this idea of what, what it is that we wanted to do and we said we need to go test it out someplace that's far enough away from home so people here can't hear about it. And so we ended up, we, got, we made a presentation to the Audubon Society in, in Olympia, Washington. We thought that was far enough away from home that whatever we talked about wouldn't filter back down. And when Jim and I went to the Audubon, uh, we drew straws to see who was going to talk first. And, and uh, Jim ended up going first. And he started in on uh, what we were talking about. We, were, we had agreed upon on what we were going to talk about. And he started in, and in, in a little bit, this, this elderly gentleman interrupted him. And he says, Mr. Neal, thank you very much. He says, but we really want to hear what the environmentalist has to say. And so I got up and said exactly the same thing that was he, he was saying. But what, what, and what we realized at that point in time is they could not hear that message from him. It, it was just, it was the wrong messenger. And, and what we realized, and, and that was a real wake-up call, for, I think, for us, is that if, if we, in fact, are going to make change, we need to send the right messenger. And, and in many cases, folks who have been involved in litigation or doing something else is probably not the right messenger to send to somebody who, who doesn't agree with you. And... Uh, it was some months, it was interesting is that as we moved forward, uh, we started talking to more and more people and, and we ended up having a meeting out here on the, on the deck um, in the latter part of 92 when a group of us got together and we actually created a board for the Applegate Partnership at that time. And I think it was a nine member board as I remember. Were you on that? Nope. Oh, okay. Uh, and we, we, we tried to have representation from the environmental interest and the farming, the farming community. Connie Young was on from the Farm Bureau and uh, Dwayne Cross was on from uh, Croman Corporation. And uh, we had uh, Sue Raleigh who was uh, the, the district ranger uh, at the Applegate and what's his name? Who was the BLM guy? Rich Drehobel or no, before, um, Armitage? No, no, even before that. Don't know. Anyway, we had a representative from the uh, BLM on the board, and we started conversations. Yeah. And uh, we didn't really know what it was we were going to do, other than what we really wanted to do was business differently than what we've been doing before. And uh, we we agreed to do f full consensus. We didn't know that that was really hard. And we met weekly for the first uh, first year. Uh, sometimes it was out here, sometimes it was in at BLM in Medford. And uh, at some point in time, uh, an, an attorney from the from the Attorney General's office in Portland came down and and informed us that we were in violation of the Federal Advisory Committee Act, that we were unduly influencing the federal government in our wildest dreams. I wish we could, or had. And, and, and what they indicated is both the Forest Service representative and the BLM representative who were on our board could not be on our board because they were in decision-making positions with the agencies that were doing the decisions. And so uh, they were asked to, to leave our board. And then we asked them to come back on our board, on, to come to our meetings as advisory committee members and and they they their job was to come and listen to the conversations and if there was anything that they could do to embellish the conversations then they were asked to do so but then they they we were not in that in this kind of relationship where we may be perceived as in uh, you know unduly influencing them and uh and, and you have to understand that, that Chris Bratt, who uh, was on, also on Headwaters and on the board at the time, and Dwayne Cross, who was from Croman Corporation, just the month before had been in district court in Eugene and was being sued by, uh, Croman was being sued by, by Headwaters. So the very guy who was literally in the process of, of suing Dwayne, they were on the board together. 
and that was really an interesting process. And um, so, as we continued on, uh, we, we we actually ended up uh, getting. We had a number of folks that that stepped up and volunteered to facilitate our meetings because we it was we were talking about very contentious issues we had people who had basically been suing one another uh, we had folks who didn't trust one another one of the things that that our group concluded was is that we didn't trust the politicians nor did we trust the media and so we made basically vowed not to speak to the media or the politicians about the process so we, we initially we avoided the county commissioners like the plague well, and the, and the state representatives and con congressional representatives as well. We just, we figured let's just uh, move forward on this. And interestingly enough, at the same time that this was going on, the Quincy Library Group had started down in Northern California, down in Quincy, California. And they, they were, had embarked on a similar path, but they had decided to changed the regulations in Washington DC which was a formidable task and so because they had chosen to do that they were very very high profile with the timber industry and and the environmental community which was really good for the Applegate partnership and watershed council well we hadn't become a watershed council yet because it focused all of the all of the focus was on the Quincy library group and nobody ever looked at the Applegate partnership because we weren't out beating the drums doing something uh, scary like ch making legislation back in Washington DC. And they didn't have any members of the agencies on their board either. They weren't No. They weren't inclusive in the same way that you no, were. No. Of the agency people. And okay. No, but one no. other thing I want to interject there is that people did hear and they did visit. The governor came down, didn't he? We had the governor, Abbott. we had a couple of congressmen, uh, there was a, we, we've had a, yeah. We've had flew in in a helicopter. We've had Secretary of Interior, Secretary of Ag, we've had a couple of presidents come here. So, so there's been, there's been a, uh, that was a little after the fact, I mean this was much, much later than, then, than early on. And didn't the forest supervisor come early on and say who gave you the permission to do this? Yeah. Yeah, and, 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 and our response was we didn't need anybody's permission to do this. It was basically we were doing this, and if they chose to listen, that's fine, and if they chose not to listen, then, that, then they would suffer the consequences, and whatever that might be. So the story about the Applegate Partnership can go on forever. I know. <laughs> and so, it's, so I guess what is most important to know, how it's affected your life or, how, or the Watershed Council or how it's affected other families what should we talk about well did it create community? huh yeah. how did it create community well what was interesting is as we can we met regularly we had to use full consensus so 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 really sticky wicked issues just weren't addressed early on i mean we really were, were working in the really soft stuff for a long time and what was interesting is after we had continu continued to meet regularly like this uh, w with somebody helping facilitate our meetings, um, it got to the point where, if, for example, if Dwayne Cross didn't show up at a meeting for some reason, Chris Bratt would say, well, you know, we can't do anything or until somebody, or, you know, somebody needs to represent the, the industry's position on this and so wh what we found is that folks who were on opposite sides of the fence were supporting the folks who were on the other side of that fence just because we had developed a relationship with all of those meetings. You were speaking each other's lines I think is how you used to put it. Pretty much, <laughs> pretty much and uh, so so th the tenors of the conversation started to change a lot and I think in 94, 1994, we, we had started a, we had been working with the BLM. Uh, the first project was the Bluefoot Timber Sale. And it was that they had proposed a, a, a number of clear cuts in, hum, up, in the hum, upper reaches of Humbug Creek. And uh, 
we started negotiating with them and we we brought a couple of forestry professors down from OSU and we actually submitted a proposal back to the agency that instead of doing a clear cut, how about they do a thinning and they do it across a broader landscape and they can get the same volume of timber, but just doing it in a different sort of way. And the agency agreed to do it. And it was interesting that when we, we finally went public with this thing and we, we uh, I think the BLM had contacted the media and said that you know they had been working with a group out in the Applegate and they had we had come to agreement and so they had we had a press conference uh, up at up on Humbug Creek and uh, the TV stations showed up and I don't remember who all the media were and we we talked about how we had come to agreement on this thing and we were moving forward and the media said well what did you not agree upon and we said we're not going to talk about it and that was what the media wanted. And then w one of our members, I, I think it was me, ended up going and, and, and talking to the uh, county commissioners in Jackson County, or at least one of them. And the first thing that he did is he went on, uh, on, uh, on the media and started tooting his horn about what this was all going on and how much the commissioners had to do with it. And it was really, it was, it just confirmed for us that you can't trust the assholes. That's a, that's a broad statement, so <laughs> you may want to cut that. <laughs> so we continued on. They actually did the Bluefoot timber sale. Uh, we didn't know a lot about what it was we were doing then in terms of the technical pieces around, you know, forest management. But we, we had a general idea of where we wanted to go. Uh, it was interesting also that during that time I, I was I was shuttling back and forth going to lots of different meetings and and I was actually asked by the headwaters board to leave their board and some of their funders had was putting pressure on them that that and at that time I was vice president of the headwaters and that I was getting too close to the enemy and that that I couldn't wear the environmentalist hat any longer and so I left I left headwaters and I, I lost a lot of respect for the environmental community when that that occurred and tell about selling your Cessna you use that Cessna to fly around and do what I called shuttle diplomacy <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, we had a plane uh, that we kept in Ashland I think we'd had it out on 10 years or so and and so we, we, we used the plane a lot to go to, to, to other places and it's a, it's a fairly quick transport system. And uh, not, not to go back to Washington, D.C., of course, but, but more, more regionally and locally. And so we were doing a lot of outreach to other, other groups that were doing similar kinds of things or what we thought they were similar kinds of things. And, and um, I don't know specifically what it was. Well, uh, people made, um, well, first of all, I think that the fact that there were so many groups shows that this was really quite a movement. And we had a meeting in Oak Ridge in the, in the school and that was partly organized. Ed by Riley's house caught on fire caught and on burned fire down when, while, yeah. while we were at that meeting. That's and, right. And I remember somebody coming up to us and saying, this is just like the 60s. This is a movement. That's you know? a movement, yeah. And but some of the naysayers were criticizing you because they saw you as an effete in, uh, and, and you got criticized by both sides, the environmentalists, we did. because you, had, you could afford a plane and that you weren't a real rancher, and by the ranchers because, and so you, ch you kind of changed your public, in my view, you changed your pu public identity and you sold your beloved Cessna that you and Susan would go camping in and, and, and bought it. But not for that reason. But okay. <laughs> and, and you, but you bought a herd of cattle. And I know that it wasn't an exchange that you had this, but you, your public. I sold had, the airplane and bought cows. Cows. Yeah. <laughs> so there was a way of gaining legitimacy in your effort to create community. So so what what we were experiencing is is that. It, it was really difficult ground. The timber industry was distrustful. The environmental community was distrustful. The agencies were distrustful. 
you know, the attorney general's office didn't trust any. I mean, it was like there was there was a lack of trust across the board. And uh, it, it was interesting as Dwayne and I ended up uh, uh, going back to Washington, D.C. Well, let me back up a little bit. We, we at some point in time, we we decided that we were working with with five land management agencies, uh, three ranger districts and two resource area management units from BLM. And what we were finding, it was really difficult to, you know, we could go talk to the resource area manager of the Grants Pass resource area, and then we could go talk to the Ashland resource area manager, and then we had to go talk to the Applegate ranger district. And it was really difficult keeping continuity of communication going you know, talking with them on one day, if I was in one mood, that the conversation might have a different tone than when I talked to somebody the next day, and it could have a totally different tone and a to totally different meaning. And what we realized is that if we were going to have continuity in this process, we couldn't keep, you know, running to all these different places. And we said, we need to, what we need is a, a, an adaptive management area coordinator, a, a person who, a single representative who represents BLM and the Forest Service. And uh, Sue Raleigh w was the district ranger at that time. We went and talked to Sue and, 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 and we realized that whomever took that job was probably going to be a dead end job for them in terms of, of career advancement. So if it was somebody who was climbing higher up the, the ladder, then it, uh, it, it uh, it was not in their best interest to, to, to take this task on. And so we talked to Sue Raleigh. Uh, Sue's husband also worked for the, for the Forest Service. And uh, we asked her if she would be willing to be the Adaptive Management Area Coordinator. And she and, and her husband talked it over and she said, yeah, she would, because they, they, weren't, they weren't desirous of moving away from here. They live in Ashland. And so uh, I went to, we met in Mark Hatfield's office, who was the senator from Oregon. And we had the regional force supervisor and the, the state director of BLM. And uh, we, we requested that those two agencies set up an adaptive management coordinator position and that it be funded 50% by BLM and 50% by the Forest Service. And they did it. And Sue Raleigh was appointed that. And all of a sudden, our job got much, much easier. And uh, we, we continued down that path for quite some time. The adaptive management area has just been taken off the books of BLM. It's no longer an entity in the, the latest resource management plan that BLM just completed here some months ago which gave us a, gives us a high degree of angst. Uh, there were 10 adaptive management areas ultimately set up in the, in the Northwest Forest Plan. And it was interesting that the, the whole concept of the adaptive management area came from the Applegate. We, the, Jim Neal, who worked for the Helicopter Loggers Association, his partner Steve, uh, his, Steve's daughter was Jerry Franklin's secretary, who and Jerry Franklin was a professor of forestry at U University of Washington, and he was the he was the the chair of the of the uh, Northwest the committee that was working in the bank buildings in Portland on the Northwest the new Northwest Forest Plan. Well, Jack Ward Thomas was, but yeah, Jack but Ward Thomas. Jerry Franklin helped out, and, and he was one of the group of seven or however many there were of those folks that were doing this this work. And so we gave the con concept idea to, to Steve. Steve gave it to his daughter. His daughter gave it to Jerry. Jerry took it to the bank building in, in Portland. And lo and behold, in the process, 10 management areas were adapted and adopted into the no Northwest Forest Plan, of which the Applegate was one. It was interesting to note that the Applegate was the only watershed that was in an intact watershed. It was the entire, you know, uh, watershed, whereas every one of the other adaptive management areas were, was a mishmash of part of one watershed, part of another, but not an intact watershed. I don't know if that's necessarily significant, but I think I, I, I think it I think it is significant. 
You were the only one with a history of collaboration also. That's correct. That's correct. <laughs> and collaboration was key to those 10 areas. And so Dwayne and I and Sue Raleigh uh, uh, made a number of trips back to Washington, D.C. Over, over the time frame that this was all occurring. And uh, it, was, it was interesting. We, it would took us anywhere from four to six weeks to get an appointment with our congressman or our senator back there. And uh, we hooked up with American Forest and we hooked up with the Timber Industry Association. And once we hooked up with the Timber Industry Association, they said, well, we'll set up your meetings for you. You just let us know when you're coming and they could get us an appointment the next day. And then I realized that the center of power and control had nothing to do with the voter in, out here in the hinterland. It had to do with the power and control back inside the Beltway. It was really, real interesting. That was really a, quite a revelation, I think. And the, and the Sierra Club was, liked it that way, and they felt threatened by oh, the movement that was going on out here. I, I had a, a, a number of meetings. I, I, I met with Mike McCloskey, who was the president of the Sierra Club. I, I met with the chair of the Wilderness Society and a number of other folks. And uh, the chair of the Wilderness Society was very supportive. He was a, a rancher from Montana. And uh, he took it back to his, he took, we, were, we were seeking support from the national environmental interest. And uh, we, he, he, he agreed, I, I met with him in their building in, in, there in, in Washington, D.C. Uh, Greg Applett was the one that introduced us and kind of got me in the door. And I had never been to one of these places. I mean, this thing was like, like a 12-story office building that was all Wilderness Society. It was a big corporation. And I just never had thought of him that way, you know. And uh, so he was very supportive of this. He took it back to his board. It happened to be the time that Clinton and Gore were the president and vice president, and Gore was the environmental vice president, and he was going to fix all this stuff. And the membership in the Wilderness Society had dropped by about 25%. They were having an economic crisis. And they ended up firing their director, who came back with this idea from us, and they, they basically took a tack to continue the war because they needed to have, the conflict made them money. That was another revelation for me that I had, you know, I, I thought these environmental groups were all kind of touchy-feely and doing it for, for the right reasons, when in reality, that was not the case. What was interesting is that, is that we, we, we actually had, uh, before the conversation, before I'd even met Mike McCloskey, we had, the lead partnership group with uh, Jonathan Cusel, and there were a group of us that were meeting regularly down in Northern California. I, our, first, our first meeting, I think, was in Mount Shasta, and then ultimately we met probably every six weeks, in, ultimately at the uh, uh, at Wheeler Brader in, uh, Anderson. in Anderson, uh, California near Reading. So there were a group of like 26 to 28 organizations that were meeting fairly regularly. Uh, Vicki went down, myself. Bev Brown went down from the Jefferson. Yeah, Beverly Brown, uh, uh, quite a number of us. So, uh, and so most of it, uh, yeah, the Quincy Library group folks were coming up, the Shastahema Bioregional group, there were just a, a, a broad range of organizations. And and we all basically were just sharing war stories with one another. It was more of a support system and kind of seeing what was going on. And at some point in time, we were approached by a foundation from San Francisco saying, we've heard what you people are doing and we would like to come talk to you. And they came, I remember that they, their representative came up from San Francisco to one of our meetings. And at the end of their meeting, they said, if you guys can pull together the, t the timber interest and the environmental interest, we'll give you a grant for $100,000. That was unsolicited. And uh, we ultimately ended up doing a, uh, a three two or three day workshop, I think you went to that, uh, in Blairsden, California at the, uh, I don't remember the name of the school now. Anyway, it's not important. Anyway, we had it in Blairsden. Uh, we invited the top 10 national environmental interests and the top 10 timber interests to come to this. And most of the money that we got was used for 
paying their airfare from wherever it was they came. The Audubon Society, the Sierra Club, the Wilderness Society, the Timber Industry Association, the American Pulp and Paper Association, and all of these guys. And it was interesting that, that, that uh, Jim, I can't remember the guy's last name, was with this, the Timber Industry Association in Oregon, said this was the scariest thing. Geislinger. Huh? Geislinger or something. Uh, Geisinger. Like that. Yeah. yeah. He, he said this is the scariest thing he had ever participated in. And they ended up saying that they would not participate in this gathering unless we guaranteed their safety by having state police there during the conference. And we ended up calling the California Highway Patrol. They ended up assigning a couple of officers to the meeting, which was totally unfounded, but it was, they, they had, he had the image in his head that this was really scary. And ultimately, I think we ended up rooming environmentalists with timber people. We didn't, we didn't actually, we had, where they had to, to bunk up together, and instead of putting two timber guys in one room, we put a timber guy and an environmentalist, just so that they could start their conversation. And, and what it was, was a coming together of community, communities of interest versus communities of place. And most of these smaller groups were basically communities of place, whereas the Timber Industry Association and the environmental interest were communities of interest. They, they had their own interest in mind. We ended up developing a number of white papers that we, in preparation for this conference. Uh, we had the conference. I don't remember the details of the conference. It's probably videotaped someplace and somewhere. Jonathan Cusel may have it. I don't know. And uh, and we spent a number of days in the field, all all of us talking together about what it is we wanted. And Mike McCloskey went back to a board meeting of the Sierra Club in San Francisco and presented a paper talking about the new and rising dogma with these, these grassroots groups out in the hinterland. And Mike and I were good friends, uh, or became good friends, but we were ideologically, so we were never lobbied by any of the special interests to do one thing or another, other than we were kind of, we were condemned from perception though, uh, that we were going to co-opt. And, uh, Mike and I had our last debate at the uh, at the uh, environmental law conference at the University of Oregon the year that he retired from the Sierra Club, and we were still at opposite ends of the spectrum. And all of our grants was a, was the chair of the Sierra Club for the Rogue Valley, and the, the 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 Sierra Club put out a national red alert to all of their organizations, all their members, to avoid participating or being with the Quincy Library Group or the Applegate Partnership. So whatever it was we were talking about scared, scared them. It was perceived that by the environmentalists that we would, that we would cave, that we, were, that we would be dupes of the timber industry who were their smart, wily folks and which was really arrogant. What was really, I guess what really bothered me a lot is they, they treated us as if we just had fallen off the back of the turnip truck and that we were gonna be turned, you know, that we would be easily swayed, which was absolutely, would have been impossible from the group that we had. The, the group that we had was so, so focused that that w was not gonna happen. Terry actually was quite involved uh, indirectly with the partnership, but it was it was interesting. At some point in time, Jackson County uh, had had was running short on money, and they decided to close Cantrell Buckley Park. And uh, I contacted the county, and I said, "So what do we need to do?" And they said, "We don't have any money. We're going to close the gates." And so uh, Terry Black and myself and a couple of others. Uh, said, well, what we'd like to do is we'll continue to water. This was in, this was in July. This was the first of July uh, of whatever year that was. I don't remember the year. And we said, we don't want the trees to die in the park. And so I said, we'll, we'll, if you'll give us the key to the pump system, we'll go down and turn it on so you don't have to pay anybody to do it. All you got to do is pay for the electricity to run the pumps. And so we, continue, we did that through into the fall of that year. And then in the meantime, uh, we drafted a, 
a a um, a letter of agreement or a a, a, a paper that we uh, submitted to Jackson County to to take over the Cantrell Buckley Park to have the community take over the Cantrell Buckley Park. Uh, it, it was not in the purview of the Applegate Partnership and Watershed Council to have it because our bylaws didn't include that kind of thing. But we we were the vehicle to start that ball rolling, and then we ultimately created uh, a new 501c3 nonprofit uh, corporation that actually became the the holder of that agreement uh, with the county. And 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 it was interesting. The county was operating the park during the months of June, July, and August on the weekends only. And they were still losing money. And the community took over the park. We got a number of grants. Uh, we basically operate the park 365 days a year. So it's open every day of the year. And, uh, and we're putting money in the bank. And so I, I doubt seriously that Jackson County, they still own the park but the community runs the park we've got a, we've got a board of, of directors that actually runs it, it, it makes the decisions on the park we we actually hired the park staff there uh, we got new new housing facility for the park we got new new irrigation systems new new restrooms uh, new road paving i mean just a, a, a lots of of stuff so i think that's a that's one example of of how the ripple effect of what it was we were doing, you know, affected uh, Jackson County. Now we went to Josephine County. Uh, there's a, a little park down down uh, uh, in, in Josephine County on the Applegate River, and uh, we went to the, the Josephine County and said that we'd be interested in in taking over the operation of that park and it and in fact at that time we had we had donors with seventy five thousand dollars ready to buy and pay for a new restroom in that park and the county turned us down because they were fear of loss of control so it's just real interesting how all all of us have our own little bailiwicks that we we protect voraciously even if it's self-destructive the Greater Applegate Community Development Corporation was the 501c3 nonprofit that we created to become the keeper of the keys for Cantrell Buckley Park. Yeah. And then subsequently, they have expanded out and have done a lot of other outreach in other areas. And at some point in time during all that process, Governor Kitzhaber, uh, at that time it was GWEB, Governor's Watershed Enhancement Board. And uh, Kitzhaber was the governor and they decided to do away with GWEB or, or the Governor's Watershed Enhancement Board and, and, and recreate it as the new Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board, which it is today. And uh, the Applegate, they, they asked the Applegate Partnership if we would be uh, a watershed council. We didn't know what a watershed council was. And so, uh, they, they had a representative come from Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife to one of our meetings and they explained what it was that we did and, and at that point in time we made a decision to become the Applegate Partnership and Watershed Council. So we were one of the, one of the first five. Uh, a lot of the work that we're doing is on, on private lands in terms of restoration work. Uh, we, we have uh, a number of, of projects that are going on. Most of it is, is aquatic and riparian enhancement work. And uh, the, the Applegate Partnership and Watershed Council, at some point in time, Jan Pertu, who was a, one of our original founding board members, became our first uh, director for the Watershed Council. And, and she was a geologist by education and by trade, and has sub sub subsequently died of Alzheimer's. Also, early onset Alzheimer's. Very smart lady. And, and we have had a watershed count, we've had a paid staff now ever since we started. Uh, so uh, we, our operating budget can run anywhere from about $500,000 a year up to about, I think our lar largest operating year was about three and a half or four million dollars. And most of that is, was done in, in restoration work. So we still meet with the, the federal agencies. We, we, it's interesting that uh, 
The adaptive management area has been dropped by BLM and uh, the Forest Service still still has an adaptive management area and they're in, in the Northwest Forest Plan and so they're still working around that. BLM says they will continue to work around the adaptive management area but it's just not on the books anymore. And uh, it's interesting that of the 10 adaptive management areas, the Applegate is the only one that, that persisted over time. The others died a natural, uh, I guess it was an unnatural death. In that basically what it was, it, it was, a, it was a, a mandate that was fausted on from on high onto the agencies. BLM and the Forest Service. So it was an un, uh, unfunded or underfunded mandate from on high that there was phenomenal resistance within the agency because it was just another damn job without any extra pay. We can either sit back and expect somebody else to do it and rail about what they're doing if we don't like it or we can fix it and do it ourselves. And we can empower ourselves to do that. And I think any community can do that but they have to, you have to have people who are willing to step up and put their, their shoulders to the wheel and make it happen.